nothing. All right, we are live. All right, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning to everybody. Good morning to media who have joined us for today. Good morning to anybody who has joined us on the live stream. And of course, good morning and welcome to all of our friends and partners who are going to be speaking on this virtual press conference. My name is Cliff Albright. I am co-founder, executive director of Black Voters Matter Fund. And I'm so excited to, to be joining you all today and to give this information about the freedom ride for voting rights. Um, we, we're, we're not excited about the reason that we're having to do this campaign. We're not excited about the voter suppression that's, that's been taking place, not just historically, and not just since the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, but especially ramped up ever since the recent elections and the backlash that we've, that we've seen. Of course, you all know 47 states, um, over 300 different bills. Um, so we're not excited about what has brought us here today, but we are excited about the response that we're going to have, the organizing that's going to take place, the massive campaign campaign and voter mobilization and community mobilization that we're going to see as we seek to pass historic legislation to correct these wrongs. And so again, we are talking about the Freedom Ride for Voting Rights. This is going to be um, an event that has several goals, right? Um, one of those goals is that we are advocating for and raising awareness and educating around the pending federal legislation. Of course, that's HR1 and HR4, right? The For the People Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, as well as for DC statehood. And so we are going to be going around, we are doing, we call it the Freedom Ride for Voting Rights. We also call it the Reverse Freedom Ride because this is the 60th anniversary of the original Freedom Rides in 1961. And so what we are doing is we're doing it in reverse. Back in 61, they went from DC to the South. Well, we're taking it from the South up to DC. And so we'll be, we'll be starting in, in Jackson. We'll be starting in Jackson, uh, Mississippi, where so many people, so many Freedom Riders in 61 ended up uh, uh, going to being arrested and going to Parchman Prison. And so we'll be uh, starting in Jackson. We'll then be going to Birmingham, Alabama, which of course we all know the role that Birmingham played in the original Freedom Rides. We'll be going to Nashville, after that. And you can't talk about the Freedom Rides and not talk about Nashville and, and not talk about the folks who, after seeing a bus be burned, after seeing the mobs and seeing people be beaten up, that you had people like Diane Nash that saw that happen, saw the images, saw the violence, and said, you know what, sign me up. I'm coming. And so we'll be going to Nashville. And then we'll be going to Atlanta. Um, and then we'll be going to South Carolina, to Columbia, South Carolina. And we'll be going to Raleigh, North Carolina. And then we'll be going to Charleston, West Virginia. Then we'll be going to Richmond, Virginia. And then we'll be going to uh, ending up in Washington, D.C. on June 26th. And so we're going to be showing a slide um, that has all of those dates and all of those locations listed. And so again, the objectives to talk about the, the federal legislation, HR1, HR4, DC statehood being a second objective, to talk about what's going on in these in, in each of these cities and states where we'll be stopping, right? Because we're talking about the federal legislation, but the reason that we're talking about it is because of what's going on in the states. And so in each of these cities that we'll be going to, we're going to be having rallies and demonstrations and teachings to talk about the local issues that are going on in those states, to talk about whether it's the, the new voter suppression bills that have been passed in some of these states like Georgia, or whether it's 
the um the the pre-existing voter suppression, right? Because some of these states haven't passed new bills because what they've already had on the books has been so effective at suppressing the votes. And so we'll be talking about the pre-existing voter suppression. So we will be raising the state issues around voter access and voter suppression. And we'll also be talking about the need for federal legislation. And all along the way, we'll be educating people around what what is this legislation? You know, why why are there these? What's the difference between HR one and and HR four? Why do we need both of them what, what do they do right what's in them um and so we'll be educating folks we'll be raising awareness and we'll be making the call and the demand that these bill be be passed so those actions will be taking place in, in each of those cities and all kinds of folks from all across the state can come to those actions from from wherever they are um, they can come to those actions and we're also going to have an opportunity on june 26th if folks can't make it to DC, if folks can't join onto the, the Freedom Ride on the official route in, at these official cities, then guess what? Just like the, the recent John Lewis Day of Action, and you'll be hearing more about that, I'm sure, from, from Barbara Arnwine and some, some others that will be speaking today that, that helped to organize the recent Day of Action. On June 26th, we'll be having another National Day of Action. So if you can't get on the Freedom Ride, if you can't make it to D.C., you still have an opportunity to be involved in the campaign because we want to have local actions, local rallies, local, local caravans taking place in cities all across this country on June 26th. While we're in D.C., you might be somebody, someplace else making the same demands. So that's what the Freedom Ride is, is going to look like. Those are the dates, those are the cities. And what we're going to do today is we've got an incredible list of partners who have signed up to, to be a part of this campaign um, and it's growing and you see the partners there on that slide and we'll be hearing from, from each of these folks today as well as some other partners that couldn't couldn't make it on today but are, are definitely with us and helping to organize and helping to amplify and spread the message and, and organize their bases. And we've got new partners joining uh, joining every day, you know, almost every hour. And so by the end of this call, we'll also give more information to those of you who are out there who want to join in, whether you're a national partner or whether you're a local partner, whether you're in one of these cities or some other city across the country, there is a role for everybody to play, including virtually. And we'll talk about some virtual um, opportunities for folks to get involved. So again, I'm excited. Our partners are excited. We don't like the, the reason that we have to do this organizing, but we believe that this is going to be a historic event. Uh, and we believe that it's going to be just one of many steps on the path towards mobilizing our communities, our states, and our country towards truly expanding, not just fighting voter suppression, but ultimately expanding voting rights. And so first, it's my honor, I'm gonna turn it over to my dear friend, Jorge Vasquez, and he'll tell you about his organization, the Advancement Project, and the role that they're playing. Jorge? Good morning. Thank you, Cliff, for the introduction. My name is Jorge Vasquez. I'm the Power and Democracy Program Director for Advancement Project National Office. For over two decades, we have done voter protections work in states like Georgia to ensure that Black and Brown voters are able to make their voices heard at the ballot box. Earlier this year, we filed lawsuits against the state of Georgia, as well as Florida to block their uh, heinous voter suppression laws, SB 202 and SB 90 in Florida. These discriminatory laws directly attack two engines of democracy, the Black church and civic organizations that serve the Black and Latinx communities, and aim to criminalize the very institutions that expand access to the ballot for people of color. That's why we're proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with this all-star team of civil rights organizations for the Black Voter Matters Freedom Ride Bus Tour. We recognize that voter suppression efforts of our opponents represent the most concentrated and extensive effort to roll back voting rights since the reconstruction. These efforts are part of a long-term strategy to silence the Black and Brown community. These strategies include reducing access to the polls. Laws across the country are attacking Sunday voting, making absentee voting harder, reducing the number of drop boxes and making it harder for people with disabilities to vote. They're criminalizing voter assistance. Simple things like line warming to make sure people are comforted while they're waiting on long lines. And they're opening up new avenues to throw out the results of elections. 
This is unacceptable and we need lawmakers at both the state and federal level to reject these racist and unjust democracy bills. We need the federal lawmakers to pass for the People Act, S-1, and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, H.R. 4. We stand united in saying this must be their top priority. We call on state lawmakers to oppose voter suppression legislation and work with us to overturn laws that they've already passed. And for all of the communities that this celebratory bus tour would touch, honoring the 20th anniversary of the 1961 Freedom Bus Ride, we want you to come out and stop by the bus stops. Bring your families, get registered, get people registered to vote, get information about how you can participate in your local municipal election this year. Call your senators to pass HR4 and S1 and get connected with groups that are organizing to fight back. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to Cliff. Thank you, Jorge. Excited to be working with you on this. Next, I'm going to go to Vanessa Gonzalez. Vanessa? Hey, thank you so much, Cliff, and thank you for having us today. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I am Vanessa Gonzalez, Executive Vice President of Field and Member Services at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Just in case you don't know who we are, uh, we are a coalition of over 200 national organizations that are charged to promote and protect civil and human rights in all persons in the United States. Uh, we were founded in 1950 and we've coordinated national lobbying efforts on behalf of every major civil rights law since 1957, including the original Voting Rights Act. Um, as my colleagues have said and my partners in this amazing bus tour, we are not necessarily happy for the reason that we are having this tour, but we need to have this tour. We are seeing evidence of growing threats to our democracy, full stop. Every day, the same opponents, and many of us know who they are, they're not new, they are not surprising, uh, from the national level to state legislatures are pushing racially, racially discriminating voting restrictions. This is a playbook reminiscent of the Jim Crow era, uh, schemes to block specifically black voters and other voters of color from the ballot. And it's no understatement to say that our freedom to vote in this country is very much in peril. So we have to take immediate and direct action to build a democracy for all of us. We will not allow people to take it away. So that's why the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights continues to call on Congress to pass the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, as well as the Washington DC Admission Act to secure statement, statehood for DC. These bills are necessary to ensure that all Americans, no matter their race or background or geography, can safely and freely cast their ballot so that every one of our voices is heard in every election and that it truly does reflect the will of the people. Along with police accountability and voting rights, there are a host of issues that are on the line here that many of you care about, that many of the communities will care about in our stops along the bus tour. This is not just about one single issue. This is about immigration reform. This is about violence against women. This is about disability rights, workers' rights, climate change, LGBTQI plus equality. It's all on the line if we cannot get our voting systems to be just. So right now we are at a turning point, even as we look into a brighter future and we are all hopeful, there's a very long road ahead of us. And that's why this coalition of folks, as well as others who may not be on the line today, uh, are working really hard to try to build the infrastructure necessary to protect civil rights uh, for the American people and for the America that we aspire to be. Together, we continue to push a solid and strong agenda for, to pass it, for passage of For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, and to address the shortcomings in the American political system. We can no longer allow this system to obstruct civil and human rights. And that starts with this bus tour. We're gonna continue that fight. We're gonna continue to press on. It's long past time to make real the promise of our democracy. So thank you again so much to our amazing partners on the line today. And thank you for having us. We are honored to be a member and a partner in this bus tour with you. 
Turn it back to you, Cliff. Thanks, Vanessa. And now my dear friend, uh, old friend, Melanie Campbell, I shouldn't say old, uh, Melanie Campbell, National Coalition of Black Civic Participation and Black Women's Roundtable. Melanie. Oh, all right, I thought you were my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, on this uh, call with you and my sister from another mother, Latasha Brown, and the whole Black uh, Voters Matter family and whole civil rights and social justice family that you have on this very, very important um, um, uh, mobilization um, with the Freedom Rides. So uh, on behalf of the National Coalition and Black Women's Roundtable, we are, we are delighted to be a, a partner. Uh, so much has already been said, um, but at the end of the day, we know all of the attacks that have taken place, especially since uh, the, um, what happened uh, in 2020 uh, with the shifting of political power in this country uh, uh, that came from Black folks, uh, with Black women driving that, young people driving that vote, um, across this country, uh, and then the, the immediate backlash uh, that took place. Uh, and I always was taught, uh, if it walk like a duck, it talk like a duck, it is a duck. And the duck is that it's voter suppression, and it is about uh, making sure that Black and Brown people and young people aren't able to vote or, or have a hard, harder time necessarily to, to, to really deal with a partisan agenda. Uh, and that's not partisan saying it, it's just factual. And so I think it's really critical and we're at a moment in time that with all this happening over 43 plus states uh, with these voter suppression laws uh, that people tend to try to placate that they're not that bad or not this, this, they are that bad. And they have a, 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 a motive that is strictly about making sure that only a, a, a minority will rule this country. So our democracy is truly at stake. Um, um, across this country. So we've been pushing and we we'll continue to push HR1 uh, that's already been discussed about the For the People Act and of course HR4 um, uh, with uh, John Lewis, uh, rest, the Voting Rights Restoration Act. And yes, and, and being here in Washington, D.C., is uh, we've been fighting for D.C. statehood for too many decades now and now is the time. So, uh, so with all that we can do to support uh, this mobilization, we will do through the National Coalition, um, whose 45th anniversary is this this year. Just we just uh, commemorated 45 years as an organization celebrating that this year. Uh, but with our Black You Vote and our Black Women's Roundtable, all of our affiliates, uh, we will, and I will be there where I can. I, I've been jumping back out there, so I'll be physically where I can be there and make sure that all of we can mobilize all our efforts uh, to this a uh, very very important mobilization. So thank you all for your leadership. And we're here to roll up our sleeves and work. So thank you. Right, thank you, Melanie. And in my opening remarks, I mentioned how you know one of the things that the Freedom Rides is actually going to be building on is the recent John Lewis National Day of Action. And so we are so pleased to have as a, as a partner the lead organization on that National Day of Action, which is the Transformative Justice Coalition. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Barbara Arnwine. Thank you so much, Cliff, and thank you to everyone who is here today because it's our partnership that's going to make the difference. Uh, I want to say, you know, one thing that people miss all every day is how much the people of America are upset about what's happening with our democracy. It's not just groups, it's not just you know, civil rights, voting rights, it's the people themselves. And what we saw May 8th was an outpouring of concern, engagement, involvement, and action by people. Uh, we had you know, 150 cities. We called for 100 cities initially to be involved in this fight. And we ended up with 150. And they had amazing local actions where they had um, press conferences, voter caves, and then they had these beautiful celebration villages where people got to participate in teach-ins and activism uh, to say that we must have a national federal response to this moment. This moment of voter suppression has been coming at us like a railroad train for years. You know, in 2011, I put out the map of shame. 
and talked about how you know, we are now entering this new age of voter suppression. 10 years later, it's worse. It's only gotten worse and it will continue to get worse. One thing we know is that we cannot win uh, this battle doing whack-a-mole. You know, uh, one state you know, rises up and wants to impose some kind of voter suppression measure. We all fight that measure. Another state blows up and then another and another and another. And we win and we lose, we win, we win, we win, we lose, we lose. I mean, this is not an acceptable framework. It wasn't acceptable in 1965 when John Lewis and so many others stood on that Pettus Bridge. It wasn't acceptable then to think that we could only win this battle state by state. In fact, what they did was they fought at the state level, but they knew they needed national legislation. Congress, Congress has a duty here. The Senate must, absolutely must, take upon itself the need to stand where it stood in 1965 and pass vital federal protection. And that's why on May 8th, you know, so many people turned out that's why on May 8th, we had, what, 245,000 people, 245,000, more than a quarter million people who watched you know, our national broadcast, tens of thousands who were mobilized in the streets. What I know is that this tour will once again give the people of the United States the opportunity to be heard, to say you know, loudly that Congress, come do your job. Senate pass S1, the For the People Act. Congress introduce and pass HR4, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, that people want to be heard. What I loved about May 8 was that was the enthusiasm of the people at the grassroots level. And we know that that enthusiasm is there because every time I mention this tour, people are like, when, where, how, and can I get involved? Because people want to be engaged. They don't want this moment to sit at home frustrated. They don't want in this moment to sit at home uh, disempowered. What they want to do is to be engaged. So as we hit city after city, state after state, and as we come to DC, uh, we will build the momentum that's necessary to remind yet again, Congress that it must, it must pass these laws. And I just wanna, uh, you know, just end by saying that, you know, nothing's more vital to America than our democracy. And nothing more is more vital to the world than a, a robust, inclusive, and uh, you know, engaged uh, and protected American democracy. So this is not just you know, wish, this is fundamentally about protecting everybody's you know, rights. And of course, DC statehood is critical and we look forward to being part of this effort and we look forward to mobilizing and organizing and engaging the American people in the way that they want to be engaged, which is activism. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara. It's always, it's always hard to follow Barbara, but if there's somebody who can do it, I know it's my friend and brother, Diallo Brooks, People for the American Way. Diallo. Cliff, thank you for having us on uh, this important conversation. Uh, once again, my name is Diallo Brooks. I am the National Field Director, uh, Senior Field Director for People for the American Way. Um, we are a multiracial, multi-generational uh, organization uh, that was founded by Norman Lear and Barbara Jordan uh, for these very fights, to fight for social justice, to protect our democracy, uh, to move our country in the direction it needs to move uh, in, in order to be an inclusive country. We're so excited to be a part of this, this coalition. I really wanna thank Cliff, Latasha, and the entire uh, Black Voters Matter team uh, for really thinking through this, uh, this, this, this event as an organizing tool, as a way to bring together our movement to push for change. We, we must be clear, we're in a national mer emergency. We're in a time where we're at a crossroads around our democracy. And a fundamental pillar of our democracy is the right to vote. We saw what happened in 2020 when you break down barriers, when you allow folks 
the opportunity to participate in democracy, folks show up. When we break down those barriers and have early voting and have uh, drop boxes where folks are able to mail in their ballots, we saw an increased participation in our democracy. But because of that, those on the right feel threatened because they do not want everybody to turn out to vote. And that's why it's important for us to take it to the streets and to retrace uh, the freedom rides, the energy uh, from our history, but also push it toward a modern movement where we're doing everything necessary to stand up for the right to vote. We need federal action. We need to see S1 passed. We need to see the For the People Act passed on the federal level. We need to break down barriers that stand in the way, some old parliamentary bar uh, uh, barriers that exist in our, in our federal government uh, to make sure that we're able to move that forward. We need bold leadership from the White House to make sure that we push this forward. We need to see the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act passed. We need to see DC statehood. And so we also need to do uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. And that's also to fight back on the state and local level voter suppression bills that are passing all over the country or being introduced all, the, all over the country. And this is not by accident. You have groups like the American Legislative Exchange Council, the Heritage Action, that are pushing these bills and have been pushing these bills for years across the country. And so we need to organize together. We need to be in coalition together. We need to stand up together to make sure that this Congress understands that we are serious about seeing real change and dismantling barriers to the ballot. It is important for folks to be able to vote. Our democracy does not function when we have the right to vote taken away from folks. We had a group of pastors in our network, uh, our African-American Ministers Leadership Council led by our current board chair, uh, Tim McDonald, Reverend Tim McDonald, and a bunch of pastors in, in Atlanta, Georgia, come together to say, Home Depot, you didn't come to the table to negotiate uh, and fight back against these voter suppression bills. And we're gonna call out corporations all over the country that don't stand with us in this fight. And we see what happened in Texas when those folks stood up because of what happened in Georgia, a lot of uh, corporations decided to come to the table and say that it was wrong um, what the Texas legislature was doing. But we need to organize our people our communities, we need to educate folks and also give folks a voice to know that they're not in this fight alone, that it's a collective energy uh, pushing back for change. And People for the American Way led by our, our president, uh, former and also former president of NAACP, Ben Jealous, we are front and center in this fight. Um, we are so proud to be invited to be a part of this uh, coalition and this effort. And we look forward to uh, stopping along the tour, mobilizing our, our millions of members, um, our networks of young elected officials, our African-American ministers to show up um, and show out at each of the locations along the route and be, be ready to rally in Washington, D.C. at the culmination of this event, at the end of this event. And so Cliff, Latasha, uh, team at Black uh, Voters Matter, really appreciate your leadership on this and People for the American Way is excited to stand uh, with this amazing coalition of folks uh, fighting back for voting rights. All right, thank you Diallo, thank you so much. Um, you know, somebody who's a newer friend to me, but who is by no means new to this battle and who has a history with an organization with a history of fighting against organized hatred and, and voter suppression and the like. I'm pleased to turn it over to Margaret Huang from SPLC Action Fund. Thank you so much, Cliff. It's a great honor to be here today. Good morning, everyone. As Cliff noted, my name is Margaret Huang, and I'm the president and CEO of the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Southern Poverty Law Center Action Fund, for whom I'm speaking today. We're based in Montgomery, Alabama, and we have offices in Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, and in Washington, DC. It's a great privilege to be part of today's event and to join these wonderful allies in launching the Freedom Ride. What is clear from our work at the SPLC Action Fund is that over the last 50 years, we have seen time and time again that voter suppression is alive and well, particularly in the Deep South. For many people in other parts of the country, 
Voting is a simple, convenient, accessible, and understandable process as it should be in a democracy that represents and works for everyone. Not so in the South. Elected officials place numerous burdens on voters to register, to cast a ballot, and to have their vote counted. Burdens that are simply unnecessary. For example, you cannot register to vote online in Mississippi. Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana all require an excuse to vote by mail. There is no early voting at all in Alabama or Mississippi. And Georgia and Florida have recently passed laws specifically designed to burden voters of color, voters with disabilities, and voter outreach organizations. The SPLC is proud to represent voters, and voter advocacy organizations in challenging many of these discriminatory laws in court. Voter suppression and those who enforce it seem to never sleep, but we are energized as Cliff said and ready for this fight because we are led by organizers and activists like Black Voters Matter and those who live and work here in the deep south who've been doing this work for generations. It is time for our leaders in Congress to step up again. We must pass the For the People Act to remove many of the harmful voting laws and practices here in the South and build a democracy that works for all of us. And we must reintroduce and pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to prevent racial discrimination in voting from continuing. The SPLC Action Fund is proud to support the Freedom Ride for Voting Rights and thank you to Black Lives Matter for your leadership on this and so many other efforts. Thanks today for your time. Thank you so much, Margaret. One of the things that Margaret pointed out, you heard her talking about the, the existing laws in places like Mississippi and Alabama on, on matters like online voter registration and, and absentee voting. And so again, those are the types of issues in the states that haven't made big headlines recently, but those are the types of issues that we'll be raising as we go along this route, as we stop at these capitals, raising the issues around the state-based issues and the state policies that are causing so many problems. So again, thank you, Margaret. Um, you know, we can't talk about the history of the Freedom Rides or the history of the Civil Rights Movement and not talk about the historic role of the Black church. And the same holds true today. And so we're so excited to have as a partner here, Pastor Michael McBride from Black Church Pack. Pastor, take it away. God bless everyone. It is great to stand uh, in solidarity and partnership with our comrades and friends. Um, from Black Voters Matter to uh, Brother Cliff and Sister Latasha, you know, whenever you call, we picking up that phone and uh, it's time to get back on the road and um, continue to defeat injustice and racism and white supremacy and structural violence, however it shows and rears its head. Um, the historical legacy of the Black church um, has often been one of the targets of um, these kinds of regressive laws, these regressive uh, attempts to limit the access to the ballot box. Um, and thankfully, we continue to carry the baton of ensuring that black religious uh, leaders and congregations can uh, show up and be heard on behalf of not just our congregational members, but the neighborhoods uh, and families in which we serve. Um, the idea that this uh, resounding defeat that took place during this last election uh, has unleashed uh, a systemic and national wave of voter suppression uh, laws and bills throughout the state houses uh, should not be a surprise to us. Uh, we know that uh, white supremacists and white supremacy is always attempting to redefine itself, always attempting to reorganize itself, um, and so must we in our efforts. Um, the idea that some of these uh, voter suppression laws are uh, claiming that we cannot give food and water to our loved ones standing in line uh, means that they are literally attacking some of the most basic tenets of our Christian faith, where we are to provide uh, food and water uh, to those who are thirsty and to those who are hungry. The idea that uh, injustice and exclusion um, is continuing to be system systematized and institutionalized reminds us of the need for uh, organized power 
uh, to defeat these Goliaths and these giants uh, of, of voter suppression. And so we are excited uh, to, to support this effort in uh, each city. We are intending to uh, put the clarion call out to our uh, ministry partners and leaders uh, to ensure that they show up, to ensure that they help um, sound the alarm on this point. And certainly we want to uh, call all pastors and faith leaders. Uh, history will continue to record our faithfulness or our faithlessness. And uh, it is our intention to be faithful. Um, it is our intention to continue uh, to expose the false religion uh, of evangelicalism in this country that uh, serves as the battery in the pack of the uh, voter suppression and uh, crypto-fascist elements that are attempting to hijack this democracy even more. Uh, and so we're very excited and we're honored to, to support on behalf of myself and Bishop Leah Daughtry, uh, Pastor Jamal Bryant, Pastor Tracy Blackman, and uh, so many others, uh, the co-founders of the Black Church Pack. Uh, we are in your corner and uh, we look forward to uh, getting on the bus or at least meeting you in the city or two along the way. Um, let's defeat these bills. Let's pass the, uh, the Voting Rights Act legislation in Washington, D.C. And uh, certainly to the Congress and to the President, we call on you to show some courage. Meet this moment. Um, let's break the filibuster. Let's not allow the rule of the minority uh, of this country uh, to hijack the will of the people. Uh, we need D.C. statehood. We need all of these bills passed so the will of the people can be carried out. God bless. Um, let's get this victory. All right. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Just want to remind the media that we're about to close out. We're going to our last speaker, but we want to remind you that we will be opening up the floor for questions. Uh, we will be uh, lifting folks up from attendees to participants so that you can ask your questions. So if you wanna go ahead, start using the, the, the chat feature to um, do a stack and just let us know. We've got somebody monitoring that. And so we will be doing that in just a moment. But first, it would not be complete if I did not turn this over to my dear friend, sister, comrade, and co-founder of Black Voters Matter, Latasha Brown. Thank you, Brother Cliff. And I am so honored for all of the um, all of our partners that are joining us in this. We who believe in freedom shall not rest. You know, this is a movement. I raise this in the context that there are kind of three cornerstones of why we're doing this. We're doing this to call into remembrance of where we have been, how we have done, how we have literally shaped the context of democracy in this country and how we are committed going forward. The second thing is that this is a space for us to recenter the conversation. This isn't a conversation, we're no longer gonna be engaged in a conversation that questions whether black people can vote or not, or whether people who actually every day, day in and day out can vote or not. We have literally, we are citizens of this country. This is a civil right that has that that we have earned, that we that part of what we own we reclaim, and that we are going to uh, we are to make sure that we protect it ferociously. And then the third is that is a recommitment. It's a recommitment and a call to action of all those. This is not a partisan issue. We should not allow voting rights to become a partisan issue. So there's a call of action to uh, in, de Democrats or Republicans or Libertarians or whatever, or even if you don't acclaim yourself to be attached with the political party, if you believe fundamentally, believe in democracy and the right for people to have free and fair access to the ballot, then we're calling you. We're calling you to action to join us um, join us on this effort. You know, I think that it's really important as we kind of go forward, there's a couple of points we want to share with you all, but we also have to not hide behind the fact that this is a big, that all of this was in response to a big lie, but we need to understand that the big lie didn't or, um, uh, the, originate with Trump. There was a bigger lie that has led itself to the big lie, and that bigger lie has been rooted in structural racism in this country that says a small group of people have the right to actually control the political process for all of us. That's the biggest lie that America has never effectively dealt with. And so as we find ourselves right now in this space around how are we going to address voting rights, we who believe in freedom shall not rest until, until it comes. And we think that we're at a crossroads, that one, we're on the road to even peril around democracy in this country or a road to progressive to, for us to really be able to make the promise of what will the nation look like 
right, when people are actually able to in, in operate in their agency and use their voting rights. It is important for us to know that, yes, this is 61 years since the, the um, since the, 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 the original freedom rise, but it also there's some things that have changed since then. Since then, this is the first time, this last election cycle is the first time that now you have a generation of new voters who have now finally eclipsed the baby boomers um, for the first time since the voting rights movement. You know, now there is a, when we're looking at America, we're looking at the diversity of America, how people have moved all over the country, including in the South. And so now what we're looking at is the promise and the possibilities of how do we move forward forward in terms of building the kind of democracy that we all deserve. The last two points that I just want to let the media know is one, there's an opportunity for you to engage in this with us. We are also inviting you to come along and be a part of this process with us. That we, as, as we talk about our stops, we want to invite you to come along and be a part of the stops, but we're also creating the opportunity where we have a certain level, we have a very, very limited number of spots, quite frankly, but a number of spots where media partners can actually be embedded with us as part of the campaign of going forward so that you can talk to some of the people yourselves, that you can actually learn what's happening on the ground um, and see some of the efforts um, um, for yourself. In addition to that, we're also literally holding a big part of this is really around how do we educate the people? You know, that fundamentally what we are doing in this tour is we're modeling how democracy is really made. That democracy is not just made by policy. Democracy is actually made by people. When people stand up and demand that their rights are um, affirmed, that demand that government is actually a reflection of what we the people want, not we the political parties, that is how democracy is made. And so given that, what we're going to do is we're going to move into a space that we're going to open up the opportunity for media. If you want to direct your questions um, to a specific person, let us know. If you have a general question, we're open at this moment to really be able to, to, to address those questions. And I'll turn it back to you, Cliff. All right, thank you, Latasha. Um, and I think uh, we'll be getting some help from Devin with the q and I think I saw one hand raised, Devin. Yes, stand by. Hey, my name is Kobe Vance. I'm a reporter with Mississippi Public Broadcasting. And as Jackson was the end of the original Freedom Ride and will be the starting point for this ride, what do y'all see the significance of that location and what will y'all be talking about when y'all uh, kick off the campaign? Okay. Latasha, you want me, to, you want to take that? You want me to handle that? Take it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, we we're starting it in Jackson for that, for that very reason. It wasn't supposed to be the end point. It was supposed to be uh, New Orleans and we actually will be doing something in New Orleans the, the day before, but um, obviously that's historically significant and not just, it's significant in a lot of ways, right? It's significant because of the issue of the freedom rise, because of the issue of, of, of voting, because of the current issues that uh, Margaret mentioned, right? In terms of like just Mississippi, Mississippi's process of voting right now didn't require a new voter suppression bill. And so it's significant for all those reasons. There's also this significance, it's not a voting issue, but just think about the, the parallels. People were put in parchment prison, which at that time, at that time was one of the worst facilities in the country. And it is still one of the worst facilities in the country in parchment. And we've seen that play out in the number of deaths, both during COVID related to COVID as well as other things. So those are the types of issues that we will be talking about when we're in Jackson. We'll be talking about what's going on in that state, what's going on specifically in regards to voting rights, but also connecting it to not only do we need state level change, but we need federal change. We cannot fool ourselves and think that fighting this voter suppression is something that can only be done on a state by state basis. It's gotta be done at the federal level. That was the entire purpose of the Voting Rights Act to begin with in 1965. Does anybody else have anything they wanna chime in? Cliff, the only piece, the only part that I'll also um, offer is that part of what we see too is that we're seeing this frame or this narrative that in some ways that when black people are actually um, elected into office or when you're seeing a turnout, there's this, this because it's rooted in structural racism, there is a, a, a something wrong. 
right? As if that, and that voter suppression doesn't exist. No, in fact, as our colleagues are on the phone uh, that are joining us today, we have actually produced results in spite of the voter suppression. It is not that the voter suppression has not been here, that even when we're seeing it in Mississippi is extremely difficult as they're saying um, to vote in Mississippi in states like Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana, what we have essentially done is out organized our opponents. And so that that's why they have done everything in their power to really be able to actually cut off, you know, and make it even that much more difficult for the work that is already very difficult for us to be able to to carry out as a community. Yes, I think Barbara wanted to say something on this question as well. Yes, um, I just wanted to point out Mississippi is so important uh, for this entire week. I mean, this week is rich. You know, we're starting on Juneteenth, right, which is an important anniversary for African Americans, where, you know, we where, where freedom was finally, quote, given uh, through the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, but people were not informed in Texas until very late. So that's why we have Juneteenth. So we're starting on Juneteenth, and we're going to end on the 26th. And, but one of the big dates uh, in there is the anniversary of the slaying, the outright murder of Goodman, Cheney, and Swerner in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And people have to remember that this is a huge anniversary for that uh, hor horrific uh, you know, response to young people uh, engaging in freedom, uh, you know, teaching and trying to register people to vote. And so this is such an important you know, week. And so Mississippi is absolutely paramount, but so are all the other states. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just really wanted to point out that that anniversary of those young people, every time I look at them, 25, you know, so many, so young, they never really lived any kind of major life, yet they gave it all for the right to vote. And we are gonna lift them up during this week and we're gonna lift up you know, this continual fight and remember that we are not, you know, that even though this is an ugly, you know, historic moment that we're in, that we come through brutal times and that we are prepared like that generation was, we are prepared in this generation to do the fight. Thank you, Barbara. Margaret? Thank you, Cliff. I just wanted to add one other point on Mississippi. Uh, just last week, the Supreme Court of Mississippi issued a decision in a case that actually eliminated the option of the ballot petition, which is one of the most fundamental tools of democracy for people to express their views. It came after a successful push for medical marijuana to be approved in the state, which had bipartisan support. And so it really reflected the will of the people. And that decision is going to have huge implications for, for future Mississippi uh, decisions and policies that are going to affect the entire population of the state. So starting in Jackson is a really important statement about the value of democracy to our states in the South and the true risks that we're encountering right now. Thanks. No, that's such a critically important point, Margaret. Thank you for raising that, the, the, the nature of the attacks against democracy. And it's just like, it's just like all other racism um, where, you know, what's targeted at, at Black and Brown and, and other communities of color and marginalized communities often becomes, reaches a point where it backfires and just becomes a, uh, has holistic impacts on the entire system, the entire democratic system, the entire economic system. And so again, that's all the more reason why what we're doing, challenging uh, this voter suppression in all its forms is so critically, so critically important. Um, I, I think we have another question that was emailed that we'll get to. And, and just quickly before we do that, you know, what Barbara was saying is the, the fourth purpose of, of these freedom rides, which is that we are introducing an entire generation to uh, civil rights history, to the history of the freedom rides, to the history of Schwerner and Goodman and Cheney and other aspects of the civil rights movement. There's very much an educational aspect to this entire freedom ride campaign, and we don't want that to be, to be lost. Devin, we want to go to the question that you have from email. And then we also have Mark Thompson that has joined us, who's an important partner, important voice, and who also speak more probably to the DC statehood aspect of what we're doing. So first we'll go to Devin and then we'll go to Mark. 
Yeah, so I have Stephen Gagliano from Super Talk Mississippi. His question is, can you speak to the role that Jackson, Mississippi played in the original Freedom Rides and the decision to start this movement in Mississippi? I think we've kind of touched on that in the, in the, the previous question. So I think, um, uh, yeah, we could just, we can move on to, to Mark. If there's something, if there's something specific that that person wanted that we didn't already address about Jackson and Mississippi, then, you know, we could come back to it. But I think we covered that already. So excited to have um, dear friend Mark Thompson, who's been such an important voice on all of these issues for, for so long uh, using his platforms. Mark, are you there? I'm here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good to see so many friends uh, for whom I work uh, <laughs> on behalf of. I answer to Latasha and Cliff and Barbara and Melanie uh, at the very least and happy to be of service. Thank you all for covering this. This, this is important. Uh, we cannot uh, rest. I know that many saw what happened in November. Uh, and what happened in January in Georgia uh, as a victory in terms of overcoming voter suppression. Uh, what happened in Georgia in, in particular was very important because you know it, it's so often people don't even participate in special elections. Black voters matter, turn that around. Um, but we've got to keep it up. We have got to make it a habit for people to get out to vote, make it a habit for people to combat voter suppression um, and even inspire people to fight for that which is so precious. It has to be precious because so many are trying to take it away. Um, Cliff mentioned statehood. This uh, uh, event, this tour, this freedom ride uh, winds up in Washington, D.C. And when we talk about voter suppression, sometimes we, we think about it in terms of individuals, uh, individual direct access to the ballot. But D.C., Washington, D.C. is his own form of suppression because you have taxation without representation. The very issue that inspired the colonists to have the American Revolution against the British. D.C. Um, pays more taxes than many states per capita and yet has no representation in Congress. When citizens who lived in D.C. were asked to serve in war, especially disproportionately in the Vietnam War. The residents of DC had no vote in the Senate to determine whether or not to send residents to war from Washington, DC, no representation. And DC is the only national capital in modern society in the modern world that does not have representation, the only capital that does not have representation in the national legislature. Uh, this is long overdue. Um, the vote has happened um, twice recently. The Senate needs to pass D.C. statehood. The Supreme Court ruled in a case several years ago that this is a political issue, not a judicial one. There is no need to amend the Constitution. And so to empower the residents of Washington, D.C., they should have two senators and a voting representative. And what that would do for the rest of the nation in terms of voter suppression it would actually end some of the gridlock we see in the Senate right now. So um, it's, it's, I'm grateful they're going to DC. I spent, when I lived in DC for 25 years, uh, I was married to HR 51 uh, and uh, HR 40, the reparations bill happened to be my mistress, but I was married to HR 51, uh, so much so. Um, it was uh, 26 uh, years ago that we got the first vote on DC statehood, um, we were the original Tea Party because we dumped tea um, on the steps of the US Capitol every week, went to jail for it. Uh, I was put in jail for a month for doing it. Monday is the 26th anniversary of me walking out of jail, demonstrating for DC statehood. Many people have been invested there, many ancestors who helped to build the statehood movement. Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton continues to hold up the bloodstained banner as well. So we're thankful that everybody is getting on board this freedom ride. And we are especially thankful that DC statehood is included in the argument about voter suppression and included in the struggle to get liberation. And I thank you all very much. All right, thank you, Mark. So we are coming to the close of this virtual press conference. We'll make one last call. If there's any 
uh, members of the media that have a question and you can use the raise hand feature and we will acknowledge you so that you can ask your question. And so we'll just pause and give that one, one a few more seconds. But if we don't see any additional questions, then we will close out this virtual press conference. But this is not the end of the organizing. This is not the end of the movement. It certainly is not the end of the, the Freedom Rides. Again, you can be on the lookout. We will continue to update you um, on, on how you can get involved. I think somebody asked a question about media. How can media get along? We will have accommodations. We will have... Um, um, we're going to have more than one bus, right? We're, we're not just going to have the, the blackest bus in America, but we'll have uh, two, two versions of the blackest bus in America. And then there'll be some spots where media will be able to ride along. We'll have our, our comms team that will make arrangements and communicate with you all about. We actually already have on our website a link mm -hmm. for media that want to make a request. Um, you can do that at our website, blackvotersmatterfund.org, blackvotersmatterfund.org, and you can go and make that request. Um, and for anybody else who's watching and listening and wants to find out how they can get involved, you can go to that same website. We have our, our partner sign up link. Again, this isn't just about the actual cities that are on the route to the Freedom Ride. Yes, we want you to join us, whether you join us in one of those cities, whether you meet us halfway and, and finish it out going to DC, or whether you just do the beginning, lots of ways that people can on ramp and get involved in the actual route. But again, keeping in mind that if you want to do a rally in that National Day of Action on June 26, we'll have those tools, an entire toolkit and resources that you can use to get involved. And so I will pause again. I don't see any other hands raised from the media. And so with that said, we will close it out with this. And as we always say at Black Voters Matter, can't stop, won't stop. We'll see y'all in DC. Thank you all for joining us.